All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Jen Tang and I'm the Director of Federal and Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. Since the lab's founding in 1931 by a young UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. We're celebrating the lab's 90th birthday this year, and to mark the occasion, we've developed an array of content, including podcasts, virtual tours, historical highlights, and this speaker series, all intended to shine a spotlight on the lab's unique approach to team-based and pioneering discovery science. As we reflect on our past achievements and imagine what the next 90 years may have in store, we invite you to join us in our celebration. We'll put a link in the chat to our 90th anniversary website where you can explore all of the different features and events. Now we're excited today to talk with you about some of the lab's unique, large scale and advanced scientific instruments and facilities, which play an integral role in our nation's research enterprise and are advancing fundamental science, driving innovation and improving the world we live in. Before we get started, let me cover a few housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar so that people who are unable to watch live can access it later via the lab's YouTube channel. There will be a Q&A session following the speaker's presentation, so please submit any questions you have for our presenters at any time, and you can use either the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I want to thank my colleagues in the Government and Community Relations Office, Strategic Communications Office, and in IT. This event would not have happened without their help. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let folks know that it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mike Johnson. Mike is the research coordinator for the 88 inch cyclotron at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And with that, Mike, let me hand it over to you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited to share with you the wonderful little machine we know as the 88 inch cyclotron. And we have been operating for about 60 years. So um, about two thirds of the lab's history, we've, we've been a part of it. Um, over quick overview of where we're located. You can see most of the lab here up on the hill and we're down here located towards uh, the bottom, not too far from the front gate and just above the Greek theater and the UC Berkeley uh, uh, stadium. So it's worth starting with what is a cyclotron and really a cyclotron is a type of particle accelerator that consists of a magnet and a high frequency oscillator and works in a vacuum. And over here on the left hand side of the screen you'll see the first cyclotron which was about four inches in diameter. And over here in the lower left you'll see the 184 inch cyclotron which uh, was the largest single magnet cyclotron ever made. And there have been a few other types of accelerators, not all inclusive, but we've had Van de Graaff generators, linear accelerators, synchrotrons. In fact, all of these machines on this slide have all existed uh, at, at the Berkeley lab. So the reason we're doing this is that what we really need are, are particles, particularly ions, which are a type of, of atom that has a, a charge to it, an electrical charge. We need particles with a high enough energy so that we can conduct scientific experiments. So getting particles this energy level is really important. And Lawrence gets credit for this cyclotron. He did the work 1929, 1930. Um, Berkeley Lab was founded in 1931. The cyclotron received a patent in 1932. Lawrence was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his efforts in 1939. And really what Lawrence did was he pioneered the concept of team science and this model of bringing researchers together to collaborate towards a, a, a large project uh, is still in use, not only at Berkeley Lab today, but around the world, it's become the norm. So how does a cyclotron work? There's complicated ex explanations out here, but I'm gonna make it really easy. We start with a neutral atom. You've got your protons, your neutrons in the nucleus, and you have your electrons uh, at the outer edge. Now, what we do is we use positive ions. So we get rid of some of those electrons, sometimes all of the electrons, and we use the leftover positive nucleus uh, to do our experiments. Those, those are what makes up our particle beams. And we take those particles and we stick them into the center of the cyclotron. If you notice our little cyclotron model in the upper left, charged particles 
normally would go in a straight line, but in a magnetic field, they take a curved path or a curved trajectory. And if you need evidence of that, if you could find one of those old uh, glass tube color televisions or computer monitors, you can take a magnet and stick it right onto the screen and you'll see the colors get distorted. That's because the magnetic field that you're putting uh, towards the screen is taking the electron beam inside there, which is a charged negative beam, and distorting the path of those electrons so that they're going to the wrong phosphors. And what we do is, is we use that to our advantage here. Those particles will stay trapped in that magnetic field, taking a curved path. And now what we do is, is we take a high frequency oscillator and we provide pulses of energy as the particles cross this gap between what we call the Ds. You can see a capital D shape here. It's how it's got its name. So particles cross the gap, they get more energy and they take bigger and bigger orbits spiraling outward uh, through the machine. And you, you can kind of see the equivalent here with a tetherball in the lower right. The particles are represented by the ball, the, the rope holding the ball. Um, is the magnet, just as the magnet holds the particles in the, in the cyclotron. And as we, the person giving the ball a whack, causing it to take bigger and bigger orbits, um, is the equivalent to the high frequency oscillator. When the, when the particles are at energy here, we stick a high voltage at the outset of the cyclotron and we extract them and they travel on in a straight line to whatever experiment we're doing. The equivalent taking a pair of scissors, cutting the rope and watching the ball fly off. Now, our cyclotron, the 88 inch, is about 300 tons of metal. And this cyclotron, as you can see it in the upper left, of that 300 tons of metal, 290 tons are steel, 10 tons are copper. We've been running since December of 1981. And we can accelerate anything from hydrogen to uranium. Um, that's pretty much anything on the periodic table. When we pull our ions out of the cyclotron, they're traveling at about a third of the speed of light. And they'll have completed anywhere from 100 to 600 orbits, depending on what beam we've been running. And down below, you can see pictures of the internals of the cyclotron and some of the early construction pictures of sitting up on top of that high frequency oscillator I mentioned in the previous slide. So what could we possibly use a cyclotron for? Well, guess what? It turns out it's useful for several things. Um, and our particular specialty, we search for new elements and isotopes. And again, elements are identified by the number of protons in the nucleus isotopes being identified by the number of protons and neutrons. We'll get into that a little bit more in a couple slides. Um, down below here, uh, we have neutron beams that we can create for researching uh, medical isotopes for cancer treatment and acquiring nuclear data. Um, and back in caves 4A and 4B, and let me add that these caves are called caves because of their concrete enclosure nature. They kind of feel like you're in a cave when you're doing the experiments. Um, but back here in case 4A and 4B, we test electronics for survivability in the harsh radiation environment of space. All of our beams start up at our ion sources, come down through the cyclotron, and then go out to the various experimental caves. Now, we coordinate this uh, very intricate uh, ballet of, of, of science from our control room. And the first uh, beam was, uh, is, is, we can see what was happening in the control room here in the upper left regular run of the mill uh, 1960s operations here in the upper right. And then the present day in the bottom two slides, here we have our operations supervisor, Brian, who's adjusting some parameters on the machine and Reba who recently retired. Uh, she was the first female accelerator operator at Berkeley lab. And she's showing how cool the cyclotron looks when you turn the lights down in the control room, which we do to monitor certain equipment where we need uh, to, to look at some faint imagery. So the beam starts here with plasma. Plasma is really an ionized gas. It consists of those positive ions we mentioned and the free electrons that we liberated. Overall, though, it has a negligible electric charge. This is the most common state of matter in the universe, not necessarily the one that we interact with most. We tend to interact more with solids, liquids, and gases. Um, but it's worth mentioning that we create this plasma by basically microwaving electrons off of the atoms and trapping them with magnets. And you can find it in upper atmosphere, fluorescent lamps, fusion reactor stars, and our ion sources at the 88 inch. And you can see what this plasma looks like here in one of our ion sources. You can see the effect of the magnets that's helping to trap the plasma. And you can see the plasma sitting here glowing a uh, nice pretty purplish color. Now, our ion sources in the upper left here, uh, Venus is one of our more recent additions from the 2000s. Um, it's superconducting, which basically means that um, it has a really powerful magnet and it's cooled with liquid helium. And we have Mars, which is currently under development, which will be even more powerful than Venus. And we do this because we need to periodically add better ion sources so that we can have higher current beams, meaning more particles that we can work with, 
higher energy beams, giving us new capabilities and improved reliability. And another ion source means we're not going to um, fail if we only have one uh, ion. If, if, if an ion source fails, we, we, we don't want to be down for the count. So you need to have redundancy. And over here, I'll, I don't want to scare anybody with any math, but you know, you have um, what's really happening here in terms of getting more energy is this mass times velocity of the ion, where it's really the energy is what we're talking about, the kinetic energy. And over here, we have the charge of the ion, how many electrons have we removed, the magnetic field of the cyclotron and the radius. And so we can't really change the radius of the magnetic field, although other cyclotrons have done that, it's very challenging. And so what we do is we just put ions into the cyclotron that have a higher charge state or more and more electrons removed. And since this side of the equation goes up, that means the energy side has to go up. So the energy of the particles we're getting out goes up. One of the things we like to do is search for elements and isotopes. And Berkeley Lab has a long history of this. We take credit for 16 elements, all designated with little red squares in the upper right of the respective boxes. And we've accelerated quite a few with our 88 inch cyclotron. Um, and those are uh, denoted by the little blue boxes. We've ex accelerated quite a few different elements. We might even be missing a few because we've been running for so long that sometimes uh, some of the details are lost in our logbooks. And it's worth pointing out that we've really come a long way. Um, in the old days, we only had earth, water, air, and fire to contend with. And we discovered that in the classical world that this didn't quite explain everything that we were seeing. So in good scientific fashion, we started poking around and found more. Now, a question can be asked, why are we working so hard at this? Are these elements useful for anything? And that's a great question. Um, and we'll focus on americium, which is one of our Berkeley lab uh, elements. Um, americium, it can now be found in smoke detectors all across America. What americium does is it sits there and it radioactively decays with uh, giving off alpha particles, which is a high energy nucleus of helium. And it gets monitored by these electronics. And whenever smoke is present, it prevents these alpha particles from going to where they're supposed to be. And all of a sudden it will start alarming with a horrific beeping sound that we all may be familiar with after burning toast or bagels. Now, just as the periodic table of the elements deals with the elements and the, the number of protons, which determines what element you are, which also turns out to relate to the chemical behavior due to the number of electrons matching those protons, we also take into account neutrons, which determines what isotope you are. And this is what we use the chart of the nuclides to look at. Along this axis are the protons, these numbers are the number of protons, each element is its own row, and the neutrons are denoted by these numbers here on the bottom axis. And this section of the chart of the nuclides is actually just this lower left portion of this much larger complete chart of the nuclides. Now, what we're interested in is this part in the upper right. And we're kind of curious what we're going to find up there. And this is where a lot of our effort is directed. So to help us with that, we have an amazing tool called the Berkeley Gas Field Separator. And really, it allows us to take an ion beam, put it on a target, and create and separate these super heavy elements. They're very massive, very challenging uh, to, to do this. And we use this to discover these new isotopes and elements. Um, at our particular 88 inch cyclotron, we found at least 10 isotopes in the 20 or so years I've been there. Um, and no new element discoveries for our cyclotron yet, though we have verified two or three uh, different elements that, that have been discovered by others. So we're getting close, but now we are actually searching for element 120. And we're at the beginning stages of this effort, could take a few years. These are very slow reactions to happen. So we have to be very patient. Now questions that we're asking, is there an island of stability? These millisecond uh, time frames that these things exist are very, very short lived. There might be some that are around for years or decades or centuries. And we're hoping to somewhere find an island of stability and give us new elements to play with. And chemistry, we don't know how these behave chemi chemically. So we're working on um, identifying some of those characteristics as well. We also have Greta, which is the gamma ray energy tracking ray. This is used to understand the structure of the nucleus of the atom. This is the most 
advanced gamma ray detection scheme of its kind in the world, or it will be when it comes online in a few years. And again, we're looking at the gamma rays, which is really a high energy form of, of visible light and indicates uh, gamma rays come from nuclear reactions, whereas X-rays come from things from, say, electrons in the orbits of atoms. But this, this Greta detector scheme will provide a huge gain in experimental sensitivity. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, we have a, a target chamber with uh, footballs, basketballs, baseballs, and we're shooting a beam of little rubber bouncy balls into this thing. And every time a rubber bouncy ball hits one of these targets, it'll it'll give off light. And then if we can backtrack and figure out all the different angles and how it all happened, we can learn a lot about the structure of what's inside these targets and in the nucleus of the atom. We also have a nuclear data group. Um, they take uh, deuterons, which is a special version of hydrogen. It's an isotope of hydrogen uh, that has one neutron. And we accelerate a beam of deuterons, and then we break it up. We separate those neutrons uh, from that nucleus, and we produce these neutron beams that turns out are incredibly useful for medical isotope research for cancer treatment, particle detector characterization. We can see how neutrons damage different materials, and we can find some really interesting uh, nuclear data measurements. And the third major area that we conduct a lot of research with is the uh, the Berkeley Accelerator Space Effects Facility. And here we're supporting national security and other US space programs for radiation effects testing. And really what we're trying to do is help spacecraft survive uh, galactic cosmic rays, solar particles, uh, planetary magnetic fields that have all kinds of particles trapped in there. All of these wreak havoc on the electronics. Uh, of spacecraft. And so we really want to make sure that we test them out on Earth before we send them up in space. And so that's what we do at the base facility. And the majority of what we do is called single event effects testing. And what we're doing is we're bombarding these parts with different ions. We're looking to see how those parts react um, and creating plots to the, to, that we can use to um, guide us in, in what we can expect for, for various spacecraft, also for aircraft as well. Um, the very first single event effects test of this nature uh, using heavy ions, which is anything heavier than helium on the periodic table, happened at Berkeley Lab in 1979. We pioneered this field, and now it's become a, a, a standing uh, test protocol to do this sort of testing before you put something up in space. Our contribution to space exploration, uh, global positioning system, GPS, has had a profound impact on our existence here on Earth, and it's used for so many things. We've tested all generations of those satellites. Mars uh, 2020, Perseverance and ingenuity, ingenuity probes, which are getting a lot of media attention for the recent helicopter flight on another planet. Um, we tested parts for that. The Europa Clipper, which we're testing for right now, will, will launch and eventually probe Jupiter's moon Europa. The Orion spacecraft will take astronauts to the moon and to Mars. James Webb Space Telescope will replace the Hubble. We will get even more amazing images. And the XEMU spacesuit, which is the next generation uh, spacesuit that our astronauts will be wearing. At Jupiter, um, right now, we have the Juno mission ongoing. And I just wanted to throw some pictures up to show some of the amazingness uh, that, that, that we can get from this. And you can see the incredible detail in Jupiter's cloud structure. Um, this Juno mission will continue for a few more years. It'll eventually plummet the spacecraft into Jupiter's atmosphere and gain even more information. The spot right here on is uh, Jupiter's moon Io, uh, the volcanic moon. You can see the shadow. And coming soon, uh, we have the, uh, hopefully we'll see the real version of this. This is just an artist's rendering of what the new spacesuit will look like on the moon. And uh, hopefully we'll catch some real images uh, in, the, in the not too distant future. The mid 2020s is currently the target goal. So in, a, in summary, 90 years later, we're still doing amazing science at Berkeley Lab and at the 88, thanks to Lawrence's initial cyclotron. Our versatile 88 inch will run forever with our fountain of youth ion sources. And we're currently conducting important research and testing in discovering new elements and isotopes, unraveling the secrets of the atom, accumulating important nuclear data, fighting cancer, and helping to explore space and help us to live better on Earth. And really, what I really want to say is that cyclotrons are just simply cool. And with that, I would like to throw the ball over to Sophie Morley. She's a research scientist at the Advanced Light Source, and she will tell us what is happening up there. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, so, just start. so today I'll be telling you about the Advanced Light Source at Berkeley Lab. Um, I am a research scientist, as uh, Mike introduced me. Um, so I, I work at what's called a beamline, 
um, at the Advanced Light Source, and uh, I'll try and explain to you what that means. Um, so we have this nice view over the bay. Uh, if you've ever been in the area, you might recognize this sort of iconic dome, which we sit under. Um, which was first designed, which was designed originally by the same architect that designed the Coit Tower in San Francisco. Um, so we sit under this dome um, and inside, uh, I think it looks a lot like the engine room of a ship, lots of electronics and metal. Uh, we even have this big crane um, and a lot of concrete, which uh, protects us from the radiation. Um, but what do we actually do inside? We are a scientific research facility um, and we primarily look at different types of materials um, on very small scale. Um, some examples are here. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, I will go into how we look at batteries a little later um, and also how we look at plant matter. Um, but we also, um, look at materials for future computing uh, technologies. Um, we look at quantum materials, which may allow us to have more advanced transportation. Um, we also have a long history of structural biology. Um, in fact, we kept the synchrotron running at the start of the shelter in place order in March, 2020, in order to uh, characterize um, how antibodies bind, bound to COVID-19. Um, which informed the research for vaccines and treatments. Um, and we also have started to do lots of interesting uh, chemistry, precision chemistry in, in um, gaseous environments. Uh, we look at energy forming processes um, and how to make chemistry more energy efficient in some ways. So this is just a small summary of, of the types of things that we do. Um, so how does the ALS link to these sweet treats? Um, so there's a sort of clue from the previous talk that the one on the left, the cinnamon roll or the Danish pastry to um, any European viewers um, is like a cyclotron. Um, but in the ALS, we have what's called a synchrotron. So they're both accelerating particles um, and the path that they take is different. So in the synchrotron, ours is going in um, this donut shape, this ring, which actually I'll explain isn't a ring. It's um, a 36 sided polygon in our case. Um, and the electrons in the synchrotron um, travel around this. They're first accelerated in a linear accelerator. Um, they gain more energy in what we call the booster ring. And then they come into this 36 sided polygon and off each section of those polygons is a tangent where a beamline lives. So a beamline is what we call a specific experiment um, that's very specialized for a certain material class or a certain type of technique. And we have 40 different beamlines at the ALS. Um, and the, every time you bend the electron path, you release light um, in these straight sections, which is what you illuminate your sample with. Um, so we use infrared light, X-ray light, and ultraviolet light at the advanced light source. This means that we can look at things that are sort of on the scale of um, electrons to atoms to molecules to sort of biological micron scale um, materials. Um, so we're really studying the science of the small um, at the synchrotron. Um, this is a snapshot of where our users come from, we welcome over 2000 users per year at the ALS. Um, this is the distribution of their zip codes. Um, and we also uh, welcome users from all across the globe, over 40 countries um, in this financial year of 2015 to 2017. So um, we're very heavily used nationally and internationally. So what are the main components of the light source? Um, so I, I've touched on these a little bit, so I'll just go into a, a bit more detail. Um, we're, there's the linear accelerator, the booster ring, um, the storage ring, and then the beam line. So we'll go into the little sort of bunker uh, room where we produce the electrons. 
um, and it's inside this um, gun, we call it the electron gun that you can fit into your hand, is where we heat up this tungsten metal um, to over a thousand degrees Celsius and we boil off the electrons and then we accelerate them in a line. So that's why it's called a linear accelerator um, into the booster ring. And the booster ring sits here. Um, and this is where they gain more energy um, until we finally insert them or inject them into what we call the storage ring. Um, and then the tangents that I uh, mentioned earlier are coming off. Um, so each experiment is coming off just sort of out of view here in this photo. Uh, which is where you might find someone like me or a user um, and quite a lot of more metal. Um, so these are the beam lines with the experimental end stations. Um, and what that means is the place where you put your sample. Um, <laughs> and they have to be under high vacuum. So a vacuum that's kind of similar to the surface of the moon um, in the beam line, because these X-rays that we produce, the light that we produce is easily absorbed in air. Um, so we have to take away all the air out of the instrument in order to get those um, X-rays to your sample in order to study uh, what's going on inside. So it's a very exciting time at that advanced light source at the minute, we're about to upgrade. Um, we will be upgrading in the next five years to a source that's a hundred times brighter in the soft x-ray region and much more coherent flux. Um, so why are we doing this? Uh, one clue is, um, you may notice in this photo, it, it's quite an old facility. Uh, it actually started in 1993. Um, so it's well overdue an upgrade. There's many more facilities popping up around the world and being upgraded. So where um, we would like to remain competitive and, and uh, keep our reputation of doing really groundbreaking science. Um, and the increased brightness will allow us to see uh, on the nanoscale um, a much higher level of detail. So the equivalent is kind of deblurring an image. Um, we'll also have uh, what's called high spectral sensitivity. So the analogy here is this whole region kind of looks purple on the on the left. Uh, once we upgrade the light source, we'll be able to say a certain region looks kind of more blue or more pink, um, which is actually to do with uh, the, the element specificity. Um, and also now we have the um, x-rays much brighter in a shorter amount of time. So we're, we're able to access real-time dynamics of um, a lot of the science that we've already been doing, maybe the measurement took 10 minutes, maybe a lot of things went on in those 10 minutes, but you averaged them out. So now we should be able to see um, things happening as they uh, really do happen in a cell or um, in, a, in a material. Um, so I'll just dive it quickly into a few uh, particular examples. So I mentioned I was gonna talk about batteries um, as we move towards a future with more electric vehicles, um, more smartphones, more laptops, um, battery technology is um, kind of lagging uh, in some ways. So research into batteries is very important in, in order to make them more efficient, more long lasting, uh, faster charging, for instance. So this is an example of looking at a lithium ion um, battery material. So this is a very small crystal. Um, this is the, the sample here. Um, and the x-rays that are being focused onto the nanoscale. Um, and this can give you information about where the lithium ions are as a function of time um, on the nanoscale. So this is a little video of um, charging and discharging of the lithium um, battery particle. And so um, when it's red, there's more lithium and green. Um, is no lithium, so there's a few charging and discharging processes happening. Um, and what they were able to figure out here is that uh, how the material degrades as a function of the rate that you charge or discharge. Um, and this was 
information that they had never seen before um, this, this measurement. And then just to give you um, an example of how the ALSU will help with this sort of research is this measurement previously took four hours um, with the upgrade that should be less than four minutes. Um, so you can imagine that you can either measure many more samples in the same time, or we actually turn away a lot of um, research proposals each year. Perhaps we can accept more and more researchers to do more and more varied um, research instead. So that's quite exciting. Um, another kind of local example, topical example, um, is to do with looking at water transport in plants. So you may have noticed if you live locally, the Bay Area has also already turned sort of brown um, and orange. Um, and previously, growers in the region, wine growers in the region, noticed that some of their grape varieties um, had survived better than others in drought conditions. Uh, so they hypothesized, there was theories that the water transport in those plants was different. Um, so what we're able to do at the advanced light source is something like um, a CT scan that you might be familiar with um, medically, but we do that on the micro scale and we can see the little um, sort of water pipes inside the stem of the plants and you can see it as a function of time. Um, and what these researchers at UC Davis are trying to work towards or figure out is more drought resistant plants um, and um, this will inform farm which, which plants farmers will grow will grow in the future if they suspect there'll be more and more drought. Um, the final example that I'll talk about is um, how nanomagnets can help um, in the fight against cancer. So this is a very recent example of some work that was done at the ALS where they looked at arrays of nanomagnets um, being able to capture and release um, biological uh, molecules. In this case, it was T cells, um, or it, in, uh, in theory, it's T cells that are immune cells that are adapted to fight cancer better. Um, so you can identify them um, in, the, in this video. It would be the purple cells are the better ones. You can electrically change the magnets to release those cells. Um, so you tell the computer which cells to keep and which to release. Um, so this is a technology that kind of started in, in some way in the 70s, but we're getting better and better at um, improving these technologies. Uh, so to summarize, the ALS is a scientific research facility um, and its main purpose is to serve the energy needs, the economic and national security needs of the US, but as also the entire uh, globe. It's open to everyone um, and it allows people to study the science of the small and the coming upgrade in that which is due to complete in the next five years should allow us to keep making these impactful breakthroughs and discoveries, hopefully for the next 90 years of Berkeley Lab. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, and the next speaker that we have is Andy Miner, who's the facility director at the National Center of Electron Microscopy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sophie. My name is Andy Miner. I'm a facility director at the National Center for Electron Microscopy, which is part of the Molecular Foundry at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. That's uh, shown here. Uh, these big towers over here on the left are um, uh, where the our microscopes are housed. Um, and I wanted to start uh, talking about electron microscopy by showing a, uh, one of the most famous images uh, in the science literature of all time. This is William Rankin's uh, wife's hand with her wedding ring on it, um, one of the first images, uh, the first x-ray image ever ever recorded. And um, you know, we all know from x-rays of our bodies and like this that uh, imaging the internal structure of things is important, being able to see through things is important. And if you now um, magnify up uh, one million times, what would the ring look like? Well, you would see the atoms. And this is an electron microscopy image of atoms of gold. Um, uh, not this exact ring, but uh, it would look like this. These are what the gold atoms look like. 
And so imaging the materials is also important. Uh, atomic resolution and even uh, in between these two resolutions. And so to give you an idea, um, this is the type of things you see inside metals uh, between atomic resolution and, and the resolution of the X-ray micrograph. And that structure, the internal structure inside materials uh, really relates directly to its properties. So what we're showing here are different defects. These are defects in the crystal structure that make a big difference. In fact, all the difference on the mechanical properties of metals and why metals are ductile and why some are brittle. And uh, some of the images are quite beautiful um, uh, and there and there takes a while to learn how to interpret these images because uh, we're looking through the material and our eyes are used to looking at things that are reflected uh, right from the natural world. And so you have to know how the electrons interact with the material to be able to interpret them. Electrons are, are powerful because they interact very strongly with uh, atoms inside materials. And with them, you can do many different things. So uh, one is called spectroscopy, which is where you're looking at the difference in the energy of the electrons that uh, went through the material to tell you about the chemistry inside the material. For instance, what atoms are there. You can also image the structure as I just talked about, and you can do what's called diffraction, which shows you an average representation of the symmetry of how the atoms are arranged inside the material. And, you know, understanding the structure is really important for the properties. This is a, a picture of nano twins in magnesium that determines the mechanical properties of, of magnesium. Uh, and here's an image uh, using the spectroscopic mode of electron microscopy, where we can actually highlight the individual atoms and color them according to what they are, whether they're lanthanum, titan, titanium, or, or manganese, for instance. So how do you see atoms? Well, uh, you need a good microscope. And uh, you can start with, of course, a uh, uh, rudimentary microscope. Uh, light microscopes are great, but they only get you so far because they're limited by the wavelength of light, visible light. So if you want to see farther, use electron microscopes. Electron micros Electrons are not limited by their wavelength. Um, that's because you can just change the energy and go up to uh, millions of volts and have as small of a wavelength as you need to image the spacings inside materials. And this is what an electron microscope looks like. To overcome resolution limits and push the field farther and farther, you need big projects. And uh, this is a, a timeline of resolution in microscopes uh, over time. You can see the plateau of light microscopes at the bottom, plateauing at the wavelength of light. And then electron microscopes were developed sometime in the, in the 1930s. And very quickly, the resolution of microscopes got better up to the atomic resolution. At Berkeley, we've had two major projects in our history uh, leading uh, the resolution breakthroughs. One was at the bottom shown here, the atomic resolution microscope, which uh, showed atoms in two dimensions, as I showed before. And at uh, about 10 years ago, the team project, which uh, really enabled us to visualize uh, atoms in three dimensions. And so I'll talk about uh, this technology development and how it impacts the way we do um, electron microscopy. This is an image showing a series of images showing uh, what happens over time as you improve the instrumentation. This is a, uh, an example we have actually in the lobby of our center because it's, it's really interesting because this is the same exact sample. It's the same sample over the years in the 80s, the 90s, and then 2009. And what it shows is, of course, the resolution getting better, meaning you can see the distance between two different atoms uh, smaller and smaller. But you also notice that there's other things like the the contrast gets better, the sensitivity gets better, the signal to noise gets better. All these qualities about an image that are important for interpreting its structure get better as you improve the optics and, and, and sources and all the other types of things in the electron microscope. So what are these things that we improve? So on the left here is, is, a, is a picture of the team microscopes, our latest microscopes. And uh, there's two specific technology developments I wanted to talk about today. One is the stage at top, which we developed and built here at LBL. And the bottom is the detector, which was also built here. So what does the stage enable us to do? Well, I talked about imaging in three dimensions. And how do you do that? You do that with tomography. And you do that by spinning a sample around, uh, hopefully in 360 degrees. So you can image it from all different directions. And then through these series of images, reconstruct where the atoms are in three dimensions. So this is a, a, a movie showing 64 different projections of the same nanoparticle. And this nanoparticle then can be reconstructed 
as shown here, where we can say which atoms are iron, which atoms are platinum. And by looking at the structure, where the, atom, where the, where the iron is, where the platinum is, labeling it, characterizing it according to its crystal structure, and that's, that's these labels here, L12 and L10, we can understand the magnetic properties, because these different structures have different magnetic properties, and this is a, a type of material that's used in, for instance, hard drives, magnetic storage hard drives, iron platinum. And so being able to look at the atomic structure and understanding how these phases fit together uh, is, is very powerful for that. The other technology I wanted to talk about was detectors. And this is a, a, there's been a revolution in electron detectors that has really changed the way we do electron microscopy. Peter Dennis and his group has, have led that here at LBL. And what they have been using is CMOS, which is called is complementary metal oxide semiconductor chips. Uh, and these are the same things that we use that are in our, our, our cameras and our phones. These are the same kind of technologies. And what this has enabled us to do is to capture electrons directly. What does that mean? Well, in the old days, you used to have to take the electrons, have them hit a phosphor, the phosphor would glow, and then you'd capture the light because we had chips that were good at capturing light, for instance. But everyone who knows about things that are glowing, like the stars you put up in your, and star stickers you put up in your room when you're a kid, uh, glowing's bad. It takes a long time. They don't stop glowing for a long time. So that's, slows things down. The The other big improvement in the technology of detectors was making them thin. Why? Because electrons, 300,000 volts, are very mean to materials. You wouldn't like a 300,000 volt electron hitting you. And it's the same thing for the detectors. And so they would deposit a lot of energy. It's like a lightning bolt. And the way that we get away with having di electrons directly hit a chip is by making it really, really thin. So that's what's shown here in, the, in this image. On the left is a thin sensor, and on the right is the, the, showing the electron tracks inside the, a big pixel sensor where you deposit all that energy. Well, if you have a really thin sensor, you just get a bit of the energy and you can survive. Um, lastly, the way we have improved detectors is by just going fast. By having a thin sensor, by not having a scintillator, you can go really, really fast. And by doing that, you can image at, uh, higher resolution because you know that every time you have a de deposition of, of energy it's only from one electron so what this technology did was actually revolutionize the biological electron microscopy field for a long time people had used electron microscopes to image proteins by averaging them and looking at the, the uh, imaging them in different directions but the resolution was not very good and when these detectors came along in 2013, it improved the resolution so much that people could now image proteins that were medically important that could not be crystallized. And this was a huge deal for the, the biological um, uh, electron microscopy field. And so these three gentlemen on the right, as you see here, they got the Nobel Prize in, in 2017. They had actually done their pioneering work on the technique back in the 70s and 80s. It was just the technique didn't work very well. But when these detectors came along, it really changed the resolution. You can see that in this graph in the middle in terms of how, how many um, proteins have been solved using this new technique. You can see the huge takeoff in 2013 when the detector was first commercialized that was, that was built here at, at LBL. In material science, we use the speed of these new detectors to actually image in different ways. So this is a, a, a movie showing actual diffraction patterns on the bottom where we're scanning it across a thin film, uh, organic foldable-take thin film, uh, uh, organic film that you would use, for instance, in solar cells. And what we want to know about this material is how the electrons might go through these solar cells and what, what their paths are along the backbones of these, of, these, of these molecules. And by having a fast detector, we can image the structure and classify it in terms of the orientation of these crystals, as shown here. And so this rainbow image that we reconstructed here actually comes from these individual diffraction patterns that we can capture very, very fast because we now have these fast detectors. And it's, it has really changed the way that we can quantify and classify materials and relate it back to their structure. For instance, whether or not this is a good uh, foldable contaic material or not. The, this, this technology development has continued here at LBL, um, and we recently have uh, built and installed the fastest electron detector ever made. This is 87,000 frames per second. And it's so fast that we can capture 
each image is just one electron hitting it. And here's a movie on the bottom that I'll show where you see the individual electron hits hitting the detector in 11 microsecond frames. And then eventually you sum it up and you get an image. In this case, it's a it's an image of our logo where we're passing the electrons through a, a basically like a stencil mask in the electron microscope. But you can see how if you capture one electron at a time, you can say exactly where it hit, which is different than if you have sort of a blooming of cap, trying to capture a lot of electrons all, all at one time. And so this detector is, is fantastic, but of course it comes along with its own problems and the problems are really data. And that's what we're dealing with now. So if you try to capture uh, 87,000 frames per second, it relates, that, that turns out to be about 200 terabytes an hour. Think about your, your, your hard drive and your computer, uh, that's three terabytes a minute. So every minute you're gonna need three computers to capture that, right? And so this is actually such a high data rate, it's equivalent to the, the data rate that the world uploads to YouTube in total. Uh, but we're doing this through one fiber optic. And so having to be able to, 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 to um, figure out new ways to analyze this data and make it useful is also part of the science that we do uh, when we develop uh, instrumentation like this as part of the technique development. Um, so lastly, I'll just stop and say that um, like uh, like the ALS and like the, the 88-inch cyclotron, we are a user facility, which is mean, this means that the Department of Energy funds us to develop new technologies, to have expertise on staff, so that anybody in the world with a good idea can come use our instrumentations for free. Of course, there's a lot of people that want to use it, so you have to be able to have a good idea, and we have external proposal review boards that screen these proposals. But if you, but if you, um, if if you do get your proposal selected, uh, you come and you, we, our staff trains you on how to use the microscopes and helps you to use these advanced microscopes as shown here. Okay, so that was my last slide, and then I guess I'll uh, hand it back to Jen and Dan. Fantastic. Thanks, Andy, for that presentation. And thanks, actually, to Mike and Sophie as well. These were all really compelling, uh, compelling presentations. So I'm actually going to invite everybody back to the screen uh, so we can begin our Q&A session. And would also love to just introduce my colleague, Dan Kroots, from our Strategic Communications Office, who's, who's joined us for the conversation today. So um, let's start with this question first. And I think we might have somebody in the audience who's maybe a high school student or the parent of a high school student. So um, are there any topics, and this question is for all of you, are there any topics, resources, subjects, websites that a high schooler who's interested in these tools um, for understanding materials what what sort of resources should they be checking out? Well, I'll, I'll jump in real quick here and say uh, perhaps um, you know in addition to what might be uh, you know the, obviously the physics and math and things like that that everybody probably already knows that that's part of the answer. I would say from my perspective, one of the things to do is to make sure to go out and get lots of hands-on expertise in whatever area it is that you're pursuing because that time in a lab or that time building something even even something like a wood shop class things like that really come in handy at, at the higher levels of research um, that that's my two cents worth there's a lot of other options and answers to that but um, I'll jump in and just say that yes there are um, many scientific uh, collaborations where outreach uh, to to younger uh, students, is part of our mission. And um, I'll, I'll give you one example. I'm on a, a what's called an NSF Science and Technology Center. And as part of that, we have an outreach uh, to uh, to younger students. Uh, you can look up our website. The website's, uh, the center is called Strobe, like a strobe light. That's So it's easy to Google uh, Strobe Center and you can find that. Yeah, in a, in a similar vein, we do a lot of outreach to um, Key stage two uh, groups. So we have a lot of resources on our website that link to those um, events, or um, there's also placements where you can come and shadow a scientist. I've had students from high school come and shadow me at the Beamline, and I, you know, explain my day to day of what a scientist is like um, and what we're what research we're doing. So um, 
and also that you know videos on the internet i i think they're very they've come a long way um they, and you can find a lot of good stuff online oh. okay. great Thank, thanks all for those questions okay. so a uh, next question um and this could be for mike and, and sophie does the does the synchrotron or cyclotron uh, make a lot of noise when they're running or is it a quiet operation um we're not allowed to be near <laughs> ours when it's running um you as a safety uh thing you'd get um a lethal dose of radiation so um it that i can tell you that on the experimental floor it's very loud just because we have a huge amount of vacuum pumps um and uh compressors um so i kind of listen to that a lot but yeah the actual running of the of the beam um I, it's not it's not super loud no and, and at the 88 inch cyclotron, as, as somebody who plays uh, some jazz clarinet on the side and dabbles in bluegrass with a banjo mountain dulcimer, I really focus on a lot of the sounds. And um, at the cyclotron, you can hear, uh, first of all, when we're running, there's a, a sonar bonging sound that indicates the cyclotron is running. So I always notice when it's not going because that tells me that something might be broken or <laughs> something's wrong. But, but on top of that, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a low level hum that happens from the, uh, the various vacuum pumps and uh, equipment we have running power supplies. And, and there's very subtle, you know, honestly, I can even hear, I can tell who's walking by my office most of the time just by the, the sound of the footsteps. And there's a people sound, right? I mean, everybody, everybody makes noise. And, and sometimes it can be really loud from some effort going on to repair something or, or build something. And sometimes it can just be very subtle. But there's equipment sounds and people sounds, and it, it, it's interesting if you stop and listen. It's a great question. C can I just jump in and say, yeah. with electron microscopes, they're absolutely silent. And you have to be quiet in the microscope room. Because when you're looking at atoms, if somebody comes in and they start talking to you, you can actually see them jiggle inside. So it's a very sensitive environment. So it's sort of the opposite. Andy, that's right. Actually, the, the microscope is actually on a separate platform, right? Isolated right. From, from sound and movement. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how, how temperature affects the microscope as well? Uh, it's, it affects it a lot. So the way the microscopes work, they're lenses, magnetic lenses. And every time the temperature changes, the metal will, you know, expand if it gets a little hot or contract. And that changes the field and that changes the focus of the electrons. And they're so sensitive that you can see it if you turn on the lights in the room you can see the temperature change. And so we um, have special environments um, that we're, and we're fighting uh, environmental issues all the time. But you can't, be, you can't be near elevators, for instance. If elevator moves in the building, you'll see the, the little magnetic distortion. Um, we do things like we use wooden chairs because if you have uh, metal chairs and somebody moves it around, you'll see that. So they're very sensitive and uh, but there's lots of tricks that we've you know learned over the over the years and so we can do that thanks all of that that was a fascinating question and fascinating answers uh let's ask this one which i think is again aimed toward all of you somebody's interested in hearing about a few examples of who tends to preserve time at your facilities um and i guess a related question is are our proposals for your facilities accepted any time of the year uh who you know if, if you could step us through the process of what it's like to become a user at your facilities i think people would be interested in hearing about that so at the go? 80 at the 88 inch um we we have Kind of some primary tier users that are our overall funding agencies that would be Department of Energy, um, as well as NASA uh, entities like that. And we also have a small portion of our beam time is from outside. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it's a small portion. It's probably yeah, it's probably around 10%. I guess it's a small portion. Um, but we have outside uh, companies, uh, private um, uh, silicon chip type companies or or aerospace type companies uh, that are able to purchase beam time. Uh, we are not a national user facility in the way uh, that the Foundry or the ALS are. We are just a user facility. So that's actually a whole couple different categories that it's not worth going into now. But uh, but we tend to not have as much of the free beam time available uh, that's, that's, that's able to be obtained uh, via the proposal method. But um, we do entertain proposals from everybody, and we accept them all year round. Yeah. 
So if you want to go next, or I can. Yeah, uh, you can go. You can go for it. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, the ALS and the and the NSEM actually very similar. So we're yeah. we're run a very similar fashion. We we have calls for proposals usually two times a year or something like that. You can always submit a proposal called a rapid proposal if you have something really hot that you got to do. Um, and so we do accept those too. And most of the people who come to use our facilities are, are usually graduate students and postdocs and, and, early, and scientists, you know, you know, permanent staff scientists that are really doing their research hands on. Um, we have staff there to, to assist uh, permanent staff who also do their own research. And so, for instance, the founder we have was called a 50 50 model which means 50% of the time uh, we do our own research with the microscopes and 50% of the time is for everybody else in the world. And uh, people come from all over and they, you know, some of them stay for, you know, months, a year, uh, and, and, and some just come for a week and fly in and fly out. Yeah, our, our process is very similar. Um, and we always have more people apply than we have time to give out. So, yeah. And it kind of varies per beam line. Um, that's usually the case is that we can't accommodate every application. Um. Great, thank you. Um, so we did get a couple questions um, inquiring about battery related research at our facilities. One of them, uh, there was a question about if there was any research uh, happening at uh, the facilities on, on the focusing on the safety of lithium ion batteries. We also got a, a question related to uh, the batteries are getting smaller and smaller um, through many applications. And if you can provide an update on how those applications are being researched as well at a facility. So maybe this is a question that Sophie could, could possibly take on as well as others as well. So yeah, full, full disclosure is I'm a magnetism person and not a battery mm -hmm. person, um, but I will try and answer. I do know that there's um, a lot of worry uh, globally about uh, the safety of lithium ion batteries and how do we dispose of them, etc. Um, and there are there are groups actually even at Berkeley Lab um, who are trying to investigate alternative materials that are less flammable um, or survive at lower temperatures or at higher temperatures more safely. So that's de that's definitely something that's going on. Um, and then the other thing I would say is a lot of the progress that we make um, in researching smaller and smaller processes that happen inside materials, it's just giving us better understanding of how to optimize these materials. And that's really a core bit of what we do is um, digging deeper into materials and trying to figure out, is there alternatives? How do they work? Um, how can we make them better, more energy efficient, et cetera? So yeah, a huge amount of our research goes into that. I can I can also add to that. I, yeah, we we do a lot of research on batteries at, at NSEM. I actually have a research grant from Toyota Research uh, to look at batteries, and and what we look at is sometimes related to the safety. Like for instance, we look at polymer electrolyte membranes that uh, might might be stiff enough to stop the growth of dendrite that would short circuit lithium ion batteries. But a lot of what we look at is actually you know basic research. So it's looking far ahead to what the next generation of batteries are. So not lithium ion, for instance, but lithium metal, which would be uh, has much higher capacity. It's a much better performing battery, but it's uh, you know much more reactive. And so you have to deal with the safety issues way ahead of time. And so um, I would say that uh, it, our new tools, you know, are, are really useful. So, for instance, that fast detector. One thing we've used it. The, one of the first samples we tried with it was to map the structure of an entire solid-state battery from the top to the bottom in cross section, where we could see all the different phases and the evolution over time. And interestingly, one of the things we found was that uh, the sample, uh, when we cut it up a year ago and when we cut it up a month ago, had changed just sitting there on the. Uh, on the shelf. So there's a lot of, you know, reactivity and in, in battery materials that you have to really research. Yeah. Thanks for those answers. I realize we're actually at the top of the hour. So, um, you know, I think this brings us to the end of the event. Uh, so before we close, I just want to thank all of our panelists once more for their presentations and also want to thank the audience for tuning in and for your interest in learning about research at the lab. So if you'd like to stay up to date on what's going on, you can visit us at www.lbl.gov or follow us on social media. We're at Berkeley Lab across the, the usual platforms. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you next time.
Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.